Hi, I'm Gina. I'm here in the sensory gym at Children's Specialized Hospital. Today, Children's Specialized Hospital and New Jersey Autism Center of Excellence is presenting the webinar, The Evolution of Ayers Sensory Integration in Occupational Therapy as an Evidence-Based Practice for Autism. Children's Specialized Hospital has been dedicated to early diagnosis for autism. It has been dedicated to evidence-based practice across all the therapy disciplines and has dedicated resources to research, staff training, and program development. We're very happy to partner with New Jersey Autism Center of Excellence. New Jersey Autism Center of Excellence's mission is to help the community understand the underlying neurophysiology of autism. This webinar is a dedication to Dr. Jean Ayers, the founder of the sensory integration theory. Dr. Jean Ayers was a brilliant observer scientist, and she connected the underlying neurophysiology to the sensory motor process and applied it as the foundation to play and learning. Dr. Jean Ayers passed the baton to the next generation of scientists, observers, and occupational therapists who further defined Ayers sensory integration. They dedicated their careers to education and research and evolved Ayers sensory integration into an evidence-based practice. Hi. I'm Dr. Zoe Mayu, and I'm happy to get our discussion started. If we're going to talk about sensory integration, we should probably start with a little discussion about our senses. We all learned about our sensory systems early on, probably in preschool or maybe early in elementary school. But what most of us learned about our senses was pretty basic. Maybe you learned that there are five senses and probably heard and thought the most about our senses of sight and sound. With us since birth, working in the background so automatically that most of us don't really think very much about them, we literally make sense of the world around us through our sensory systems. Even though we do not need to think much about them, we do take in information through all of our senses so that we can figure out the world around us, gathering what we need to know about people and objects and experiences that happen to us every day. We do this through the well-known senses, such as sight and sound, as well as some of the lesser known senses, like our sense of body position and our sense of gravity and motion, which together tell us where our body is and how we're moving through space. Without even thinking about it, sensation guides our actions. For example, if we're on a swing and we're moving in one direction, we have a sense that tells us about the direction we're moving so that we can make automatic adjustments so that we won't fall off the swing. We use our sense of touch to plan actions with the small muscles in our hands to be able to perform intricate actions such as knitting or putting on an earring. We use our refined sense of touch in our mouth to move food around for chewing and swallowing and also to know when we might have some food on our mouth so we can fix that before we get embarrassed. We use our lesser known senses to help us to know where our body is so we can automatically know how close to sit next to another person or how hard we may be hugging someone or petting an animal or even knowing that a sock or a sleeve is twisted. And we do all of these kinds of things because our senses are working for us in the background through a function called sensory perception, helping us to make automatic adjustments and actions so we can be successful at tasks and be free to think about other things. We also have a protective aspect of our sensory systems that is working throughout our day to help us block out information that might be unimportant at the time, but to be ready if something important happens that might be dangerous, or if something occurs from which we may need to protect ourselves. When that happens, that type of sensory information will come through loud and clear. This is called our sensory reactivity function. If you think about an activity such as walking down the street with friends, maybe you're drinking coffee and you're thinking about the activity that you're going to be going to. Your interactions, what you're saying, what's going on with your group of friends, all of these things you do are guided by sensory functions that you don't need to think about. Where you're placing your body, how you're putting one foot in front of the next, or maybe how you're keeping your balance as you're jostling through a crowd, your sensory perception functions are happening behind the scene while you're thinking about the fun experience with your friends. At the same time, you have reactivity functions that are guiding you. So you can block out the sounds of the horns that are honking or maybe the smells that you're passing on the street. 
still you will have a little radar that's working to keep you safe so that if a car is coming too close or if you might get splashed by a wheel going through a puddle, you would be able to react quickly and appropriately to keep yourself comfortable and safe while you continue to pay attention to the things that are important to you. In these ways, sensory perception and sensory reactivity work together very effectively for most of us to allow us to move through our days successfully and safely. However, for an autistic person, walking down the street with friends, filtering all the sensations, the sights, the sounds, smells, along with knowing where your body is in relation to the people around you, can be a challenge. Hi, I'm Dr. Suzanne smith Rowley, and I'm pleased to be able to share information today about sensory integration and autism. I've been an occupational therapist for over 40 years, and I have personally seen the incidence of autism in children climbing. The estimates, according to the Center for Disease Control, now are one in 54 children have autism. Since the DSM-5 edition of atypical sensory responses in autism, we have learned a lot more about the sensory contributions to children with autism. The prevalence estimates are 80 to 100% of individuals with autism have sensory differences. And these differences are reported in children and self-reported in adults. Dr. Ayers proposed her theory of sensory integration and intervention methods starting in the 1960s. And she contributed to the literature Back in 1980, she published a study on intervention with children with autism who had sensory reactivity differences. Later, she published her study showing sensory perceptual and praxis differences in children with autism. Since then, occupational therapists working with children with autism report using sensory integration methods with children with autism. Our 2015 study confirmed Dr. Ayer's findings. In our study, we found visual abilities were a relative strengths with challenges in all other sensory motor and praxis areas. Our findings are consistent with adult reports of autism, such as those by Temple Grandin, who talked about thinking in pictures with the strengths she had in her visual system and the difficulty she had in understanding her body and for which she developed the hug machine, which helped her um, regulate and also feel her body better. An understanding of these developmental abilities reframes our view of autistic features. For example, we may see a child who doesn't do what they're asked because they don't know, they don't understand, or they don't understand quickly enough what's being asked of them. We may see a child who has difficulty engaging others for co-regulation, or a child may have difficulty planning activities and resort to repetitive actions or sensory seeking activities. As we better understand the why, we're better able to address the underlying barriers to participation in typical daily life activities. It may also provide insights into early signs and symptoms of autism, such as dysregulated behaviors or fine and gross motor skill development. But we know what to do. We've been doing this for decades. Through a better understanding of sensory related challenges, we can employ this play-based and customized sensory motor intervention method that's been proven effective to support children and families to lead their best lives. And now I'd like you to meet our friend, Joey. Hello, I am Joey. I am a young man with autism who does not use speech to communicate. I am able to communicate best when I am typing. My speech does not match my real intelligence. I am very distracted by meaningless things. I can't control my body or emotions. This makes me look retarded. Understanding things and not being able to talk is very frustrating. My thinking is so much more than some think. Movement is like moving the mountain with a spoon. I am trying so hard to control all that is happening and you see how it can't happen. 
My movements come from cues and rote moving. When I am in an environment, I am always looking for order and need things to be in a certain way. I am not wanting things to be chaos. I want order. My body just does this out of need. It is also about the relationship you have with the other person. Each of us are trying to be more when we are together. The relationship is to expect each individual to have a want to be together and know the real me. Each of us want to be accepted. We want people to know that we are listening, and we want to be included, but our bodies don't cooperate. Please think about learning to know more about movement and communication. They work together, and my ability to be the person I am is dependent on you thinking this is possible. Hi everyone, I'm Dr. Roseanne Schaub, and I'm going to talk with you about the scientific basis of air sensory integration. You'll understand that treatment is designed to facilitate the brain's ability to process and integrate sensation as a basis for adaptive behavior. Let's take a look at this concept, experience shapes brain function. Air sensory integration is built on the idea that the brain changes in response to the experiences that it encounters. This process is known as neuroplasticity. And in fact, neuroplasticity is a well-supported concept in the neuroscience literature. Dr. Ayers was aware of this concept of neuroplasticity and that the sensory systems are a potent mediator of this neuroplasticity. In other words, she knew that experience shapes brain function and she built the theory of sensory integration around this. Dr. Ayers understood that sensory experiences are what bring information into our brain, as you see on the left there. Thus, she hypothesized that meaningful, active sensory motor experiences would enhance the brain's ability to process and integrate sensation through neuroplasticity. This concept of neuroplasticity, specifically sensory neuroplasticity, is the scientific basis of air sensory integration. In fact, we have a body map in our brain, and this body map becomes more detailed and sophisticated based on the experiences that we have. This is called the homunculus, and you can see a representation of it in this slide. Everyday sensory motor experiences enhance the detail and sophistication of the homunculus. And this then provides the foundation for more advanced actions and interactions in the environment. In air sensory integration, we engage in meaningful active sensory motor activities at the just right challenge that are tailored to the child. You see them on the left-hand side of your screen. But what we're actually thinking about is what's going on in the brain. And more importantly, how does what's going on in the brain translate into everyday life? Autistic persons often have challenges in sensory integration. One example is that there may be confusion when integrating two or more sensations. Let me give you an example. When you're interacting with someone, you're listening to their speech and you're watching their mouth move. Auditory and visual information is integrated simultaneously in the brain so that you can respond. In autism, this simultaneous integration may not occur. Instead, there is a delay. We call it a time window delay, a delay between when visual information is processed, when auditory information is processed, and when they're integrated. It takes the brain longer to process because they're not being integrated simultaneously. Can you imagine how confusing this must be for a person with autism and how challenging it may make their everyday actions and interactions? So a large part of what we do in air sensory integration is build a body map in the brain. And this helps to foster multi-sensory integration so that actions and interactions are more seamless and effortless. Plus it's fun. In fact, this is one of the key elements of air sensory integration that it's contextualized in play. That's because the brain likes things that are fun and it's more apt to pay attention and change in response to them. This then will further facilitate 
neuroplasticity. So you can think of air sensory integration as being neuroplasticity in action. Sensory integration is a term that many people have heard in association with autism. Air sensory integration is a specific intervention that is trademarked. And one of the reasons that this term is trademarked is that there is a lot of confusion about sensory integration. When the diagnosis of autism was increasing, there was also an increase in the awareness of autism and the sensory functions that go along with it. There are many examples in the media, films and television shows, even programs for children that have emphasized some of the sensory differences and sensory functions commonly associated with autism. In general, this has been a good thing because having increased awareness about something like our sensory functions is important for helping all individuals to be understood and also for all of us to understand ourselves better. On the other hand, some of this increased awareness has led to confusion as well. For example, there are now many treatment approaches that include some type of sensory input, often with a lot of sensory stimulation. For many people, these types of interventions can be disorganizing and overwhelming. However, passive sensory stimulation is not what air sensory integration is about. Air sensory integration is a specific approach that respects the interest of an individual and considers ways to incorporate those interests as well as a person's areas of strength. In the air sensory integration approach, therapists aim to help a person use their interests and strengths while engaging in sensory motor activities and experiences as a way to build and expand abilities. For example, if we see a child who's obsessed with dinosaurs, rather than try to extinguish that interest or say, no, that's enough, we don't want to hear any more about dinosaurs, instead, we would celebrate that interest. And we might find ways to use dinosaurs in play so that the child would be motivated to try something new or challenging. And who knows, maybe a child who's interested in dinosaurs would eventually have an interest in archaeology or biology and could build on this interest for even a lifetime of learning and exploration. In the air sensory integration approach, the therapist is not going to plan regimented or passive activities or stick to a set repertoire of actions to do to the child. Rather, in this approach, we have a strong emphasis on interacting with alongside the individual in partnership, prioritizing interests and strengths. Every person is individual. And so therefore, in the air sensory integration approach, every intervention plan is highly individually tailored. We see each person as an individual and try to understand the unique challenges, interests, values, desires, strengths, and motivations that are important to that one person. We work together in a therapy program with the individual in a respectful way to address needs and to build on strengths. Some autistic people over respond to touch, sound, or movement. So in therapy, we provide the nervous system with heavy work to the muscles, deep pressure to the skin, and sustained linear movement to the vestibular system. This helps the nervous system to decrease its flight, fight, freeze reactions, allowing more interaction for daily tasks. So when we are doing this, we are affecting brushing teeth or eating new food. Other autistic people have difficulty with praxis or motor planning, and others with using their core muscles for balance or coordinating their core muscles with their visual system or having postural stability for fine motor or oral motor skills. In therapy, we engage the touch system with sensory experiences. We challenge the muscles in the just right way, and we scaffold movement and play opportunities, eventually taking the building blocks for motor coordination so that the autistic person can use their sensation with their nervous system to generate ideas and to initiate, plan, and sequence their tasks in their daily routine. Hi, Dr. Schaff here again with some really important news. Occupational therapy using air sensory integration is an evidence-based intervention. 
Evidence-based means that multiple studies have been done using rigorous methodologies with positive findings. In our 2014 randomized control trial published in the Journal of Autism and Developmental Disorders, we showed that children with autism ages six to nine who received occupational therapy using sensory integration improved in their individual goals, in their activities of daily living, in so, and in socialization in comparison to the control group. This then provided important evidence. Further, Pfeiffer and colleagues in 2011 conducted a study that had similar findings. This designation as evidence-based is important because it means that insurance companies will now cover it, which in fact is the case, and that more children and families will have access to this important and needed intervention. Our randomized control trial not only provided evidence, but it also provided a manualized protocol or a guide that could be implemented clinically and replicated scientifically. This is also an important aspect of evidence-based intervention. This protocol provides a blueprint for implementing occupational therapy using air sensory integration, using a data-driven and systematic approach that's focused on meaningful outcomes. Let's, in this data-driven decision-making process, we go through a series of steps that begin with identifying the person's strengths and participation challenges. Why are the strengths important? These are important because we want to build on their strengths and incorporate their strengths into treatment. For example, Dr. Mayu talked about a case of a child who loved dinosaurs. For this child, we would consider that a strength and we would utilize dinosaurs in our pretend play activities. We might use dinosaur clothing or even a dinosaur costume if we're working on dressing and find other ways to integrate an interest and strength in dinosaurs in the intervention. After we find out a little bit more about the child, we decide whether air sensory integration is the appropriate theory to guide our intervention with the child. And if so, we conduct a comprehensive assessment of the sensory motor factors that might be impacting participation challenges. And we link these to the goals and outcomes that the child and family or teacher or other stakeholders desire. Next, we set the stage for intervention, remembering that occupational therapy using air sensory integration is contextualized in play, is at the just right challenge, and utilizes the child's interest and strengths. Conducting the intervention is personalized or individualized to each child's unique set of needs and strengths their context, their interest, and their family. We call this individually tailoring or personalized intervention. Thus, the evidence-based approach for air sensory integration is data-driven, outcomes-oriented, and individualized or personalized. It's important to understand this so you can assure that the intervention that you choose for yourself or your child is in keeping with the accepted scientifically validated methods. We often receive inquiries from families searching for an occupational therapist who can provide sensory integration intervention. Therapists should have postgraduate training in the air sensory integration method. Credible therapists are going to welcome the questions about their credentials. As Zoe previously stated, using isolated sensory strategies does not meet the criteria for an air sensory integration approach. Based on the American Occupational Therapy Association guidelines, air sensory integration is customized based on assessment according to the manual with fidelity to the methods. Inquire about what type of assessments are going to be used. You want to ensure that the therapist is trained in standardized assessments, such as the sensory integration and praxis tests, or the evaluation in air sensory integration, in addition to the use of questionnaires and clinical observations. Ensure that the assessment results are analyzed for the relevance to your concerns in daily life. 
Your occupational therapist is an important partner in ensuring your child's progress towards meaningful outcomes. Air Sensory Integration, an integrated nervous system, comfortable responses to stimuli, interpretation of sensory information, ability to respond to the world around you, choosing and doing for the joy of living. Thank you, Dr. Jean Ayers, for setting us on this journey.